Hello, I'm Lisa Archibald from the University of Western Ontario. This is a video to accompany the release of our Oslo working paper and report from a working session we held November 9th of 2018. The presentation was conducted along with my colleagues, Dr. Janice Cardi and Dr. B.J. Cunningham, also from the University of Western Ontario. That workshop was attended by about 85 speech and language pathologists, most of them from Ontario, some in person and some by webinar. So what is a working paper? A working paper is an official report produced by a group of people who are studying a particular problem or situation, especially in order to give suggestions or suggest improvements. The problem that we were studying is terminology for child language disorder, and we addressed a number of questions that I'll review briefly in this video. In Ontario, can we use diagnostic labels? Why do we need specific terms or labels? What labels should we use? And what are the next steps? So first, can speech language pathologists in Ontario use diagnostic labels? Recently, the College of Audiologists and Speech Language Pathologists of Ontario produced a practice advice article that was relevant to this discussion. We considered uh, the ident definition of diagnosis that was outlined in that article. A diagnosis is the identification of an underlying disease or disorder that causes a communication disorder. And members then cannot communicate the disease or disorder that causes the communicative dysfunctions that they might observe in their assessment. One example of that is autism spectrum disorder. However, there's, members have a clear professional obligation to communicate their clinical findings regarding communicative symptoms and dysfunctions. And when they're doing that, they can use terms like mild, moderate, or severe, or profound, and they can use a term like disorder to describe those communicative symptoms and dysfunctions. So with regards to children with persistent language disorder then, labels that do not implicate a cause can be used without restriction. Some examples include language disorder or developmental language disorder. However, labels that implicate a cause are restricted. So an example is language disorder associated with a biomedical condition. In this case, the member is restricted in referring to the biomedical condition unless it has already been diagnosed by an authorized healthcare professional. Please see the practice advice article for more details regarding these issues. So if Ontario speech language pathologists are able to use terms to describe communicative dysfunctions and disorders, then the question is, do they in fact do so? Do speech and language pathologists use specific terms to describe developmental language disorders? And amongst our workshop attendees, 65% said no, they do not provide a label when sharing clinical findings for language disorders. But of interest, they would use specific terms like stuttering and aphasia. We found similarly in a national survey that was conducted by my student Alyssa Kuyak and me, that 23% of responsible speech and language pathologist responders in Canada indicated that they would rarely or never use a label. And research as far as long ago as 1997 had similar findings, where nearly 30% of participants had never been given a label for their communication disorder. We also asked speech and language pathologists to rate assessment priorities and providing a label to a parent was considered lower than the, uh, any of the other options that we provided. So the answer to the question of do speech and language pathologists use specific terms to describe developmental language disorders is many do not. Let's consider the question of why we should use labels. So why use an informative name? Well, what are some of the pros to that argument or the advantages? Well, one thing is that it provides an ease of communication, a verbal shorthand for representing features of the disorder. It also provides knowledge that can be empowering and provide understanding of the kinds of difficulties a person might be experiencing. It provides an opportunity to reattribute the symptoms to the disorder itself, which can buffer the self-image of individuals. 
and it provides hope for enhancing treatment access, availability, and effectiveness. Academic accountability can also be altered when a specific label has been given. What are some of the concerns regarding providing a label? Some of the cons. Well, one is around expectations and stigmatization. There is a concern that there could be selective attention to behaviors that are so associated with the label and then ignoring other strengths a child might have or other characteristics that are not consistent with the label. That expectations might be couched in terms of the label. There's also a concern that there's inconsistency in label use, and that can be confusing. And there's a feeling that, that having a label has no impact on service, or it may even exclude those who don't qualify for the label. So let's consider that debate in more detail. With regards to the concern that there's no special intervention or service that exists for individuals with this label, so there's no need to label. Well, if these children are not being labeled, then there's no service for them. Of course, we're not creating service for children who don't exist, don't have a problem. So unless we begin to identify that problem, there's no way to advocate or do, do research that would provide the, the information regarding the necessity of the intervention for them. With regards to the concern that students without the diagnosis may be neglected, in fact, improving services for those with the disorder helps those without the label. We increase the capacity of the whole group to manage children with the disorder and characteristics that are similar to the disorder. So by improving that capacity for those with the disorder, we improve the services to those who, who have share similar kinds of difficulties. Labels may not be applied consistently. Well, that's a problem, but it's a problem we need to specifically address rather than abandoning the practicing practice of providing informative labels altogether. And the concern on expectations and stigmatization. Well, certainly we need to go beyond the action of providing labels. We need to educate others. We need to encourage inclusion. We need to consider strengths. We need to describe what's going on with this particular child. But the label provides a starting place. It provide, it brings out the problem into the open, lets people just talk about it, lets people get to know it and understand it better, which can reduce the stigmatization. Let's consider our assessment values and expectations. We've already said that many speech language pathologists are not using labels in a consistent way. In fact, speech language pathologists tend to be diagnostically agnostic. They tend to be terminologically flexible and place low values on labels. For them, assessment determines eligibility and treatment goals. But let's consider the case for parents and caregivers. Parents and caregivers come to assessment with unresolved issues surrounding the nature of their child's difficulty. And that's an ongoing source of parental distress and confusion. They're coming seeking answers. They're looking for a diagnosis they understand. They'd like to have a sentence that says, this is my child's problem. And then more detail about what that problem looks like but they'd like something succinct that they can remember, that they can hold on to, that they can provide as an answer to family and friends when they ask them what they learned at the assessment. They, have some, they place some value on labels because it provides the understanding and answer that they're looking for. And for many parents, this never happens. From a parent's perspective then, what information do they need? How can parents equip themselves to assist, support, and advocate for their child? What do they Google? Think about yourself. When one of your family members has a concern regarding their health or educational achievements, one of the first things you do is go to the internet to look up that information. You need a term to go and do that research around. Parents need the same thing. They need an informative name. They need a label that they can remember, that they can 
Google, that they can find information about, that they can talk to others about, that they can compare with other parents, uh, with other uh, families and friends. Imagine if we don't provide a consistent label, then these parents are out there alone with no one else, knowing no one else who has a child with the same kind of problem that their child has. So what would increase the use of an informative name or a label in child language disorders? Well, for one, if we had a clearly recognized label that we were all using consistently, that would have an impact on our practice. It would also lead to a better understanding of the profile because it would allow us to focus research on that, uh, that particular area. Uh, it would lead to more public awareness. Think of the group with dyslexia and how uh, effective they've been in terms of increasing awareness of uh, that disorder. It will lead to more services. Uh, think of the group with autism and how effective they've been at creating resources for services. Most of you would find that if you asked your family and friends if they knew about dyslexia, if they knew about autism, lots of them would have at least passing familiarity with those terms. How many of them would know about developmental language disorder? Not very many. And maybe that's because we've never told them about it. So having a clearly recognized label would lead to advocacy uh, that would be focused on having that label. So if we're moving along in our thinking towards perhaps it would be good to more consistently use labels, then what labels would we use? Well, recently there's been two studies that have addressed this question specifically. They're called the Catalyse studies, and there's lots of information available about them, and you can look at them in more detail. These were um, survey studies that looked at a Delphi consensus process involving 59 international experts, eight of whom were Canadian. They dealt with criteria used to identify language disorders and also terminological issues. It's the terminological issues that I'm going to highlight in this video. As I mentioned, there's lots of uh, available information about these studies, summaries on YouTube, slide shares, um, and also the papers themselves, um, and also the second paper was open access. So let me just review the terminology highlights from study two. There was agreement that the overarching term should be language disorder, and this would identify persistent language problems with a significant impact on everyday social and educational progress. This language disorder was not considered to refer to late talkers who were resolved by five years old, because that problem is not persistent. Nor was it considered to refer to uncomplicated phonology problems in preschoolers who may be considered to have a speech sound disorder. Typically, this group also has favorable prognosis. It's not those whose sole problem is limited exposure to language of instruction, for example, English language learners. And nonverbal ability was not set as a criterion. So even those with low nonverbal ability could be identified with a language disorder. That overarching term was separated into two subtypes. One of them was language disorder associated with a biomedical condition. The biomedical conditions could be something like autism spectrum disorder or uh, fragile X syndrome or some other medically diagnosed uh, condition. It was thought that these children might need some more specific approaches in assessment and intervention, and so it was best for them to be um, identified under this category of language disorder associated with their condition. The second subtype was developmental language disorder. So in short then, it was children with that persistent language problem with a significant impact on everyday social and educational progress who didn't have another biomedical condition that was explaining their language disorder. Those children then were considered to have a developmental language disorder. In a recent study, uh, prevalence estimates for these conditions um, were that about almost 10% of children might have a language disorder that fits one of these subtypes. In fact, developmental language disorder was as common as dyslexia, but and much more common than autism spectrum disorder. Those are sobering numbers. Consider 
the awareness, the resources available for a condition like autism spectrum disorder, that's considerably more rare than developmental language disorder. As you can see, developmental language disorder is still fairly broad. So even when we use that term to describe the language disorder of a child, we'll need to go on and describe the characteristics for that particular child in more detail. We'll need to describe the nature of the language impairments across domains. We'll need to consider the risk factors uh, that are associated with that child's language disorder and also co-occurring disorders that might be associated with that child's particular profile. You'll notice with regard to the nature of the language impairments that there is no suggestion of further breaking uh, the development of language disorder down into specific subtypes regarding syntax or semantics, etc. And that's because we don't really have evidence of reliable subtypes. So definitely there's a need to describe the particular characteristics of that child around these domains, but we don't have any uh, further specific labels to use for those areas. So that's what's in the consensus, but I also want to address what's not there, what's not been recommended uh, from those Catalyst studies. Well, first is a distinction between delay and disorder. So we have had in the past this idea that delay and disorder might be distinguishable in practice, that one might uh, represent a flat profile versus a spiky profile. And we really have no evidence for these sorts of distinctions. In fact, we're moving away from the use of the word delay to describe children's language difficulties uh, in order to separate ourselves from those past practices. This relates to the case where we might not be confident that the language problem that we're observing is going to be persistent. For children over five, this doesn't apply. We can be confident that language problems observed in children over five years of age are going to be persistent. In the case of under fives, however, it could be that the nature of the child's impairments, their risk factors, their co-occurring disorders are leading us to question whether in fact this is going to be a persistent language problem. In that case, we're recommending the use of the term language difficulties. Importantly, even in children under five, in the case where you're confident that the language problem will persist, the term developmental language disorder can be used. But where you're not sure, language difficulties may be preferred. There's also no distinction between expressive versus receptive disorder. Again, the evidence does not support that distinction. And finally, there's no a use of cognitive reference. That is that low nonverbal intelligence does not preclude the diagnosis of developmental language disorder. Once again, I'll refer you to our report for considerably more detail regarding these issues. So we have the term developmental language disorder to refer to a persistent language problem with significant impact on everyday social and educational progress with no known biomedical condition. Is it a perfect term? Well, it might not be, but can it work? Well, that's up to us. If we work together, we can make it work. In fact, there's been already lots of progress at raising awareness of developmental language disorder. There's been a prominent uh, rattled campaign uh, that started out in the UK but has now gone internationally with our new website radld.org and I urge you to have a look at it for lots of great links and information about developmental language disorder. There's also a new website DLD and Me again that has lots of great information. You might be aware that recently SAC put out a statement and has a forthcoming research page on DLD. And at Western, we've got lots of great projects that consider developmental language disorder that I'm very proud of, and I urge you to have a look at them. This is a point in our careers where providing a label has some utility. Parents can go and look up developmental language disorder and find some good quality information. So now is a great time for practice change. What would it take to achieve practice change? Well, it would take some international momentum, and that's already started, and we want Canada to join in. 
It would take availability of high quality resources for both you as professionals and for, for parents that we can find. And this is again already happening. Search up developmental language disorder, you'll find some great stuff. And it will take advocacy, both within our profession and beyond the profession. From all of this thinking, we've created our working paper. And I invite you now to have a look at its main points and join in that campaign. The General Assembly, or membership of OSLA, recognizing the rights of parents, caregivers, educators, and the general public to know the name and characteristics of their child's or student's communication disorder. Observing the inconsistency with which speech language pathologists provide a specific name or label for a child's language disorder. Expressing our concern that failure to clearly identify developmental language disorders contributes to a lack of understanding about and resources devoted to the disorder. Noticing the recent international consensus in terminology for children with language disorders and efforts to raise awareness of people with language disorders. Resolves the following. We strongly recommend the adoption of the international consensus terminology for describing children with persistent language problems with a significant functional impact, including language disorder as the overarching term with subtypes language disorder associated with a biomedical condition and developmental language disorder. We urge the allocation of appropriate resources to meet the needs of children with language disorders from various sources, including, but not limited to, government funding, nonprofit organizations, and private support. We commit to action towards advocacy, awareness, and resource development to support children with language disorders and their families and teachers as children learn, grow, and achieve their potential. To join a provincial working group addressing this OSLA working paper, please contact OSLA or me, Lisa Archibald, at larchba at uwo.ca.